Cole and Dr. Wally Bartfay. And in this lecture, we shall examine major neurological disorders, which are defined as diseases of the central and peripheral nervous system. We will begin with a brief overview of the human brain and nervous system, and also examine uh, things such as traumatic brain injuries and concussions, Parkinson's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, ALS, and some common forms of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Now, let's begin our learning adventure. Let's begin with an overview of the human brain. Well, the adult brain is composed of approximately 40% gray matter and 60% white matter. It weighs between 1,300 and 1,400 grams. 60% of the brain is composed of fat. These are essential fatty acids, or EFAs for short, that are derived primarily via the diet. And if an individual actually has an imbalance of brain EFAs, it may be linked to certain brain dysfunctions, some problems with cognition and memory, and also certain diseases. Here's a brief overview of the nervous system. Well, the nervous system consists of two main divisions, the central nervous system, abbreviated CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, abbreviated PNS. So what is the central nervous system? Well, major structural components include the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the brainstem, and the spinal cord. What does the autonomic nervous system do? Well, first of all, it's divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic components, which control various body functions and responses. They govern involuntary functions of both cardiac and smooth or involuntary muscles and glands. What is the PNS? Well, the peripheral nervous system the, is the major structural components here include cranial nerves three through 12, spinal nerves, associated ganglia, and peripheral components of the ANS. The ANS is divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic components. Here in this chart, we see select organs or glands controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Basically, one stimulates the production and the other one sort of decreases or slows down the production or inhibits the production. So if we look at eye on top, for example, the parasympathetic ANS will constrict the pupils, whereas the sympathetic ANS will dilate the pupils. If we look at heart as another example, parasympathetic will slow or decrease one's heart rate, whereas the sympathetic will increase or accelerate heart rate. Let's look at neurology from a public health context or perspective. Well, public health professionals and workers approach neurology more broadly than neurologists by monitoring neurological disorders and related health concerns of entire communities and promoting healthy practices and behaviors among them to ensure that populations stay healthy. They also focus on health and disease of entire populations rather than on individual or single patients. And this is from the World Health Organization. Public health care professionals and workers are also concerned with actual and potential th threats to neurological health across the lifespan from a holistic perspective. Evidence informed public health interventions and public health initiatives are concerned with monitoring of neurological health at community and population levels. And finally, some of the activities include surveillance, identification of etiological factors or risk factors, if you wish, such as social determinants of health, promotion of healthy lifestyles, behaviors, and environments. A growing burden of neurological disorders is reaching a significant proportion of countries now with a growing percentage 
of older adults affected who are, in, who are over 65 years of age or older. Here we look at aging population trends in Canada. Canada's population, first of all, could reach 40 million by 2036, and nearly one in four will be over the age of 65 by this time period. If we look at this graph here, life expectancy trends in Canada, and we look at 1921, for both males and females, the average life expectancy was approximately 60 years of age. By 2041, it will be in the 80s. Here's an example of two major neurological disorder trends. So we see increases for Alzheimer's disease and other noted dementias. Here we see 2011 all the way up to 2031. And we can see the numbers increasing over 500,000 here. Also for brain injury, traumatic brain injuries from 2011, hovering around the 300,000 mark and going around the, over the 400,000 mark by 2031. So what are the estimated costs for caring for various neurological conditions? Here we look at 2011 and 2031 comparisons. We have on, uh, on, first of all, on top of this graph, we have traumatic spinal cord injuries. And of course, the big one here is traumatic brain injury, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is the second uh, one that costs the most for caring for individuals affected. What are neurological disorders? Well, neurological disorders, we define them as diseases of the central and peripheral nervous system. They include the brain, the spinal cord, cranial nerves, peripheral nerves, uh, nerve roots, the ANS, neuromuscular junctions, and of course, muscles. Examples here include Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, stroke, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, meningitis, Japanese encephalitis, tetanus, and traumatic disorders of the nervous system. There are two major types of brain injuries. They are either acquired or traumatic in nature. So let's begin first by examining what are acquired brain injuries. So these are defined as an injury to the brain, which is not hereditary, congenital, or induced by a birth trauma. Hence, it occurs after birth and is not in utero. So an example of this might be a stroke as shown in this photo here to the right of your screen. Let's look at traumatic brain injuries, some Canadian statistics here. It is estimated that 1 million Canadians are currently living with a TBI and over 10 million people globally experience a TBI every year. And some of the major, of course, causes are falls, uh, motor vehicle accidents, and assaults. Falls are a major source of TBIs, especially among seniors with mobility and balance issues. What are some major signs and symptoms associated with a TBI? inability to think, reason clearly, there could be problems with recall and memory, the individual will experience difficulty concentrating, they will complain of headaches and dizziness, they will often have fuzzy or blurred uh, vision, they may experience nausea or even vomiting, uh, which, may may, which may also indicate uh, increased intracranial pressure here, balance issues, feeling weak or exhausted, irritability. Uh, afterwards, they will often experience depression and be sadness. There will, uh, they will experience anxiety and nervousness. They will have intense emotions. And of course, alterations to sleep or sleep disturbances are also quite common. What is a concussion? Well, a concussion is a type of brain injury caused by the brain moving inside of the skull. It can result from any impact to the head, face, or neck, 
or by a blow to the body that results in a sudden jolting of the head. So the brain moves violently back and, back and forth in the skull. It often causes damage and or results in changes of how brain cells function. Some of the common signs and symptoms here, it may be confusion, disorientation, there may be a loss of consciousness for the individual, memory loss, uh, incoherent speech, headaches and dizziness. They will often have sensitivity to light, difficulty concentrating, uh, sudden fatigue, nausea and vomiting, again, which could be an indicator for in increased intracranial pressure, ringing in the ears, and a dazed or vacant stare of the eyes. So from a public health perspective, we would like to always prevent this. So here's one example of how we can prevent it, and that's simply wearing bicycle helmets. In Ontario, Canada, it is compulsory for children under the age of 18 to wear a bicycle helmet. Ironically, adults currently are not required to wear a helmet uh, in Ontario. But we know that between 30 and 53% of cycling fatalities occur in children and youth, with most resulting from collisions with motor vehicle accidents. And according to one Canadian study, cyclists who died of a head injury were three times as likely to not be wearing a helmet compared with those who died of other injuries. Hence, if you're going to cycle, folks, please put on a helmet. What is the Glasgow Coma Scale? Well, the Glasgow Coma Scale is widely employed internationally to assess acute head and brain injuries. It's currently employed in over 80 countries uh, around the world, and it has been transcribed into various languages. It is the most widely quoted scale in published neuroscientific journals as well. The updated and modified Glasgow Coma Scale consists of 15 points maximum and has three main components, best eye response, best verbal response, and best motor response, which we shall explore in more detail shortly. Severe score is less than 8 or 9, moderate is 8 to 12, and minor is greater than 13. So the best eye opening. The maximum score here is four, where the patient spontaneously opens their eyes to a response, right? Or number three would be opens eyes to name or command. And the U here um, would be no opening of eyes to any stimuli. stimuli. Sometimes we cannot assess it, uh, let's say an emergency room or in a critical care or trauma center. Uh, because of uh, periorbital edema, there may be trauma to the eyes or to the orbital socket. For example, for a motor vehicle accident, if the person wasn't wearing their seatbelt and may have hit the steering wheel or actually had their head go through uh, the, the, the windshield of the car. The best verbal response means they're orientated times three. When we chart that clinically, that orientated times three is, re in, in, is in reference to person place and time. They know who they are. They know uh, where they are, for example, in a hospital, and the time. Uh, they, they may know it's night or day or the month and year, for example. And of course, other scores, if they're confused and so forth going down, they would receive uh, uh, lower and lower scores. And sometimes we cannot, of course, test it because they may have an endotracheal tube in place or may have to be ventilated. Uh, so we're unable to, to test the communication here. Best motor response to external stimuli. They're able to uh, follow commands. Uh, typically we do, you know, squeeze my hands or raise uh, your left hand, raise your right hand or blink twice, things like this. We can assess their best motor response. Um, and going down the list uh, all the way to no response. Uh, number two, maybe abnormal extension present. Extension of the arm and elbow is very typical with uh, adduction and internal rotation of the arm and shoulder. Uh, 
Sometimes we may actually apply a small amount of painful stimuli, which are very minor in nature, where you would squeeze the individual's nail beds, for example, and using a pen to see if they respond to, uh, to that painful stimuli as well. Here's a suggested additional reading. It's neurological disorders, a growing public health concern. Well, that's all folks for part one. In part two, we will be examining various neurological disorders, the major ones such as multiple sclerosis, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease and various forms of uh, dementias and Parkinson's disease. Cheers.